Well, happy Sunday, everyone, and all who are watching online, we welcome you to our worship today. You know, back in February, uh, we watched uh, America, the world, really, uh, with our Super Bowl. Over 160 million people watched the Super Bowl game uh, that day. But I would fathom that just a short four months later, many people would fail to remember who actually even won the game. Most people, not Jake. Beside that, I would think even some of your more aggressive fans would have a hard time telling us what the score of the game ended up being. But by the way, and if you're under the age of 25, you wouldn't know the fact that back in the day, the Dallas Cowboys actually played in Super Bowls. A number of them. If you don't believe me, Google it. You'll see it. It's there. Even some of the biggest NFL fans would have a hard time naming the last five champions. And the most ardent and biggest NFL fans, I would say, would have a very hard time talking about the stats or the scores of those last five games. But 2,000 years ago, on the very first Super Sunday, we're still talking about that victory. And we still remember the stats from that day. The day that the gospel was unleashed. So, open up your Bibles this morning to Acts, the second chapter. We're going to read. When the day of Pentecost came and they were together in one place, suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house as they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So, if, if you're not familiar with uh, and have not read a lot uh, from your Bible, you wouldn't know what this word Pentecost means. There were several Jewish feasts that they celebrated on an annual basis. The biggest of these celebrations was Passover. And when they remembered the deliverance from Egypt, but 50 days later was the celebration called Pentecost. Penta, 50, that's where that comes from. That was the time when they remembered, in, during Pentecost, the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai after they had left Egypt. Now, you can go back to Exodus, the 19th chapter, and you can see the, the, the beginnings of Pentecost and read all about where it says that there was a storm and that there was wind and there was thunder and there was fire that had come down from heaven that day. And it all represented the presence of God. So you're a Jewish person, it's Pentecost, you're remembering that day, what had happened in the initiations of this day, this holy day, and now you suddenly hear the wind, you see the fire come down. But this time, God is not resting on a place. This time God is resting on people. So we read in verse 6 where it says, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderness because yes. Each one heard them speaking in his own language. Yes, it was a crowd of, of Jewish people, but it was a Jewish people from all over the Roman Empire. Jews lived all over the empire, and, and it would be in their heart's desire to make that journey and go to Jerusalem for a Passover. And if you could arrange that trip, and you were going to make that long and very costly journey, that you were going to stay those 50 days and wait so that you could celebrate Pentecost too. So a lot of Jews who didn't grow up in the region where we, were, where we see Jesus and his ministry, Hebrew is not the native language. As we read in Acts 2, and you realize that there are as many as 12, 13, 14, maybe even 16 different languages that were spoken then we understand 
And we see verse 7 that tells us that they were utterly amazed. They asked, are not all of these men Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears in our own language? Every culture has a way of expressing or maybe suggesting that someone or someones are not too very bright. Maybe you've heard the phrase, he's a clown short of a full surface. Maybe you heard, she's proof that evolution can actually go in reverse. Or maybe you've heard, he's so dumb, blondes tell jokes about him. In that day, if you wanted to question someone's intelligence, you would call them a Galilean. Because everybody knew that they were the least educated, they were uh, the least trained, they were the least equipped of all of the people in Israel. So how can Galileans suddenly be speaking in all of these different languages? Well, some people said it that, that the explanation was, well, they're drunk. Just like those Galileans, they're, they're drunk and it's not even 9 o'clock in the morning yet. Well, they were under the influence. But it wasn't the influence of alcohol. And, and, and it wasn't what has gotten into them. It was who had gotten into them. And the least group that you could pick to launch a global movement suddenly became the most empowered ever. But they didn't talk about how they could talk in these different languages. The focus that we see here was not on the gift. The focus was on the giver. Verse 11 is very important for us as we understand this scene where it said, We heard them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. They were talking about God. They were telling us what God is up to because declaring the wonderful works of God is the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit. So if you're a note taker, I want you to write this down. And if you're not a note taker, write this down. In the book of Acts, every time the Holy Spirit comes in, power, people start talking God. And every time that there is a filling of the Holy Spirit, there is an immediate telling of the gospel. See, that's why the Spirit came when and where he did. Jesus had said before he had ascended, uh, before he had ascended now go back and wait. He didn't say go off to a private retreat and hide yourself. He didn't say go off into a closet by yourself. Isn't it interesting that the Holy Spirit came right in the middle of the hustle and bustle of the busiest and most crowded city in the busiest and most crowded time that he could possibly be there. Because the Holy Spirit, it comes to us, but many times for others. You are sealed in the Holy Spirit. If you are in Christ, you are sealed for the Holy Spirit. Your salvation is sealed. Not your lips. That's important. And when you have a chance to talk about the wonderful works of the Holy Spirit, and you get afraid, and you don't do it, that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes so that the gospel can go. Because the gospel needs the prophethood of all believers. Now, I know what you're saying, Lee, especially some of our English teachers out there. You made up a word. Yes, I did. I'm good at that. But, but I didn't make up the idea. You've heard that the, the, the scriptures talk about the priesthood of all believers. And that's every Christian is a servant. But before the Bible talks about the priesthood of all believers, Peter talks about the prophethood of all believers. Let me show you. Verse 16. Uh, they are asking, what's going on? So Peter explains to them. In verse 16, it says, this is what was spoken of by Joel, the prophet. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. 
even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Some of the last days are referring to is the final chapter of God's redemptive program. The story that started with Abraham is now in the final move of God. And it was always God's intention in this last chapter of his story that all of his children would be divinely empowered messengers of God. Jesus told us this was coming. Remember, remember Jesus told us about his parting gift. He told his disciples, now, you're going to be called before men. They're going to question you, but don't be afraid because Jesus says, my spirit will give my disciples my words. Because that's my word. And this promise was for all races. The, the, the Holy Spirit was going to empower people to go. Every tongue, every land, every people. And this promise was for all genders. Men, women, were going to be a part of God's plan to unleash the gospel to the world around them. And I'm sure that people were shocked to hear that this was the deal. But everybody who fights or has fought fire knows when you get fire together with a strong wind, you cannot control what happens. Trust me, I know. I lived in California. Mm -hmm. And when the Holy Spirit comes, you can't control. You can't control when he's going to come. You can't control who he's going to come. And you cannot control how he's going to use them to advance the gospel into the world. Because the, the Holy Spirit doesn't just come to us. He comes for us. But he comes to us to use us. To unleash the gospel to the world around us. He came not only to empower our talk. He came to empower our walk. And so after telling the crowd what they needed to know. What's going on. Peter says. I'm going to tell you what you need to know. And he starts preaching from this spot. The very first gospel sermon. Read with me. Starting in Acts 2. Beginning in verse 22. Men of Israel. Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. And this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death, nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead. Freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. I'm excited about this. I'm excited to preach on a regular basis, but I'm really excited to be preaching about preaching. And I'm excited that I'm getting to preach about the first gospel sermon that was ever preached. And everybody knows that in every good gospel sermon, you've got three points. And Peter's did too. The first point that we see is death is defeated. Remember, the gospel is news. It is announce, announcing an event that actually happened. And what happened, Peter says, did not catch heaven by surprise. This was always God's plan A. Read that again. This man was handed over to you by God's, what does it say? Deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you put him to death, but God raised him from the dead because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Now, there's a mystery here that I don't fathom, but I believe because Scripture tells it to me. That God does not plan evil. But I believe we do see that God does use evil in his plan. God never makes you choose evil. But God's plan is not interrupted when those that do evil choose evil. He can even use their choices to still accomplish his holy plan. And, and, and to show this, Peter quotes later in the sermon from Psalms, the 16th chapter. He talks where David said, 
You do not abandon me to the grave. You will not let your Holy One see the de decay. Well, well, who was he talking about? Peter? David wasn't talking about himself there. David's grave is here. We can actually go to it. We can see it. He was talking about the Messiah. Don't you understand? It was always God's plan. It was God's messianic intent through the Messiah to defeat death from the very beginning. Now remember, he's preaching this in the city where they killed and buried Jesus. Christianity was not birthed some 2,000 miles away in some remote place and then brought somewhere else. It was right there. This was the city where it should have been the most easy just to go and get the corpse of Jesus, bring it to the people, and show the Peter that he was wrong. But they couldn't do it because the tomb was empty. And everybody knew it. They could not discredit what God had already accredited. Because Romans 1 in chapter 4 tells us that he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. There are faiths today that claim that to be a Christian, that, that they actually teach that the resurrection was an impossibility. But that's okay, they say. That's okay. Because what's really important is that all old things can become new again. What? You know, the resurrection of Jesus is mentioned in the New Testament 104 times. Christianity without a resurrection is not just missing the last chapter. It's missing the whole story. If the tomb is not empty, then Christianity is. But that day, the gospel was in, unleashed because everybody knew that that tomb was unoccupied. And those people, men and women, went into the world and they could not be intimidated. Yes, they could be threatened. Yes, they could be imprisoned. Yes, they could be tortured. They could be martyred, but they couldn't be stopped because Jesus had already defeated death. Later, Paul would tell us to, the, to Timothy, he said, with the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from, the, from before the beginning of time. To show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus our Savior. He broke the power of death. He illuminated the way of life and immortality through, where was it? The good news. So let's say you have to go to work this afternoon, and maybe some of you probably do, or have other plans, but you want to watch the game. You're a big fan, it's really important to you, you want to see what's going on. But, the worst thing happens. You're on your way home from work, and someone tells you the score. <laughs> your team won. Will that affect the way that you watch the game? In the first inning, you're watching it, and your pitcher gives up a grand slam, you're down 4 nothing before you even get up to bat. In the second inning, the left fielder drops what's an easy fly ball, allows two more runs to score, 6 nothing, and you're in the second inning. What in the world are you going to do? Are you going to stand up there and scream at the television set? It changes everything. How you handle the trials and the setbacks and the obstacles of life when you know that your team cannot lose. It changes everything. This past year, we've had a number of funerals. I, I know this sermon makes a difference. I remember a story of a preacher one time at a funeral. He was behind the casket and he was standing there. He was explaining to and what was going on. 
with the resurrection. He was trying to explain the resurrection to the people that were there. And, and he looked down and he said, all we have here is the shell. The nut is gone. I'm sure those early Christians must have seemed like nuts to the world that was around them. But they could not stop because Jesus had stopped the tyranny of the grave. Amen? And God raised up Jesus, but not just from the grave. Verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, Hebrews received from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit. And check this out. And has poured out what you now see and hear. And that brings us to the second point of our lesson this morning, that Jesus is exalted. You see, Peter keeps emphasizing what God thinks of Jesus. God affirmed his ministry through miracles and signs and wonders. God reaffirmed his sinlessness, his perfect efficacy on the cross by raising him from the dead. And now God has confirmed his steps by seating him at the right of his throne. And as Peter explains, what he's asking is, it is Jesus who is pouring out the Holy Spirit on all of us. By, by, by the way, this is a technical note here. No one can be baptized by the Holy Spirit. But you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit because this is the privilege, this is the right, this is the honor that is given to Jesus, our exalted Lord, to pour out His Spirit on all of us who believe. That's His job. Why is that important? Because they saw the signs and the wonders and the miracles. They saw it all and they said, you're a fraud. They heard him say from his mouth, I am the son of God. They called him a liar. And they killed him. And now Peter says, what you are watching is what Jesus is doing. Because a higher court has overturned the verdict. Look at verse 36. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. I'll say it again. Nobody makes Jesus Lord. God already did it. God made him Lord. God declared him Christ. And suddenly, this good news gospel sermon has become very bad news. Look at the next verse. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? All of history hinges on this answer. And what if the answer was nothing? What if the answer was you can't do anything? You had your chance, you blew it. God doesn't give chances to those that mess up. You can spend eternity paying for your iniquities. But then, that bad news became very good news. Verse 38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all of those who are afar off. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible and not one where you would think because where my favorite part is is the part that doesn't get talked about. I love the part that says the promise is for all who are afar off. And that brings us to the next point. All are Invited. No one is too far from the gospel because the gospel is unleashed. The gospel reaches past race. The gospel reaches past tribes and colors and tongues. There is no ethnic group that is too far from the reach of the gospel. The gospel reaches past status. You can't be too old. You can't be too young. You can't be too rich, too poor, too educated, too illiterate. You cannot be too far from the gospel. Because the gospel reaches past gender. 2,000 years ago, 
we, 2,000 years later, we are still telling the world that your sex, one way or the other, your gender, one way or the other, makes you less important or more. <clears throat> but the gospel reaches past all the bigotry and says to every single person, you are valued, you are important, you matter to God. And the gospel reaches past anything in your past. Maybe you had an abortion. You're not too far from the reach of the gospel. Maybe you walked out and blew up your family and things have never been the same. You're not too far off from the reach of the gospel. If you've been in prison, if, if you are in prison, if you've lived your life in prison by addiction over and over again, you have to know that you are not too far off from the gospel. If you're thinking today, I can't believe I did it. I wish I could go back and change it. I've told God a thousand times, I'll never do it again. But you did. Yeah. You're not too far off from the reach of the gospel. And here's how I know that. Because the gospel that it was preached that day was the gospel that could reach the very people that killed Jesus. And if that's the case, then that gospel can reach you and I today. Amen? Amen. God is bringing the whole world together in Christ. In fact, Super Sunday is really a reversal of what happened in Babylon. Many years ago in chapter in Genesis chapter 11, mankind was being wicked and rebellious towards God, and God confused the languages of the people. And the result was, ever since then, that the men have been divided. But here on Super Sunday, God changes the plan. He's bringing people from different languages, different tongues, and different places, different lands together, and they're going to speak the same language again. But this time, the language that they're speaking is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was 1917 and Cam Townsend went to Guatemala to spend a year giving away Spanish translated Bibles to those that lived in the region. And on his very last month that he was there, he ran into an Indian from the Kachikil tribe. He gave him one of the, one of the Bibles, but the man, the Indian, could not read it. But he did tell him, he says, if your God was so smart, why can't he speak in my language? Cam spent the next 13 years, so convicted by that conversation, spent 13 years translating it for this tribe of people, about 200,000. And in the process, he started a little organization, you may have heard of it, the Wycliffe Bible Translators. Because he understood what everyone who has received the gospel understands. That, that Jesus is the language of redemption for every tribe, for every color, for every tongue, for every language. And in Jesus, God is going to bring the world back together. If you could imagine first century explaining life in Jesus. And that you... Your neighbor would find out that, that you had become religious. That's a good thing. They ask the question, where's your temple? Well, um, we don't actually have a temple. Jesus is our temple. Well, they say, well, uh, where do your priests work? Well, we, we don't actually have a priest. Jesus is our priest. I said, well, where do you go to give sacrifices to the appeasement of your gods? Well, we don't go anywhere to sacrifice because Jesus already has been our perfect Sacrifice. Well, the neighbors would say, well, what kind of religion is that? And that's the point. It's not religion. It's the gospel offering a relationship to God through Christ. Religion offers rules to get right with God. But the gospel says no one can do enough to get right with God. The gospel says, says Jesus can get it right for everyone and did. And the gospel says that anyone can be right about Jesus. And that's really what Peter was trying to get across to everybody in this soul sermon. And it is all leading up to basically one last question that he has. Do you agree with God 
about Jesus. The points in Peter's sermons is to turn your back on Jesus is to turn away from God. And I know we're all supposed to, to, uh, to say, I, I know that's not politically correct these days to say it this way. I know we're supposed to say that we believe in God. We just have different paths and you choose this path and I choose this path. And, and, and some people choose Jesus and some people don't. That's the politically correct thing to say. But no, no, that's not what Peter preached. Peter preached very clearly that if you are anti-Christ, you cannot be pro-God. Because God made it clear that what he thinks, he made it clear what he thinks about Jesus. And that's why the, that's why the audience was so cut to the heart. That's why they were so eager to get baptized. That day, 3,000 people got baptized. And by the way, in the New Testament, nobody argues about the conversation of baptism. They really don't. We've come up with those arguments. In our day and time over the last 2,000 years, all the arguments about people uh, uh, being baptized or not being baptized, we, we, we brought those to the table because they understood baptism is simply my publicly proclaiming to the world I agree with God about what he said and what he did through Jesus Christ. And once I knew what Jesus did, and once I knew what Jesus said, I agreed with God, and I said, get me into some water, I'm going down. Because that's what I needed. Once again, if you were old enough to remember the last time the Dallas Cowboys were in the Super Bowl, you might actually remember a man by the name of Evil Knievel. He was a motorcycle jumping daredevil back in the 70s. He made his name by jumping trucks and animals and canyons and gorges. He broke over 400 bones in his body. Human body has 204 bones. Puts the number in perspective for it. By his own admission, Mr. Knievel was an evil man. He was a wicked man. He struggled with alcoholism. He, he, he struggled with broken relationships and failed marriages, a terrible temper, imprisonment on more than one occasion. But towards the end of his life, he had a very real sense that he told people that he sensed God saying, Robert, that's his real name, I have spared you and rescued you so many times. It is time for you to get to know me through Jesus. So he found a Christian friend. He didn't have a lot of them. But that friend gave him a book. And that book was called The Case for Christ. He read the book and he said, I don't know how to explain it, but I just came to believe. I just began to believe in Jesus and I got down on my knees and I asked God. I said, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. 30 years before this, he had, he had already created and had his tombstone engraved. Because when you do what he does for a living, the chances are very high that you're not going to make it to the end of the day on some of these things. And the tombstone talks about all of his uh, accomplishments and everything that he had done. And you can go to the cemetery in uh, Montana and you can actually see the tombstone. But on the other side, after this was all done, he had composed the words, believe in Jesus Christ. So what do you do when you believe in Jesus? <coughs> Well, he went to the local church there in Montana where he lived, and he said, I want to get baptized. The pastor asked him, he said, would you like to give a testimony uh, before the baptism? And he said, yes, I would. So he told the congregation everything about what his life had brought him to, how he had come to believe in Jesus, and that that was why he wanted to be baptized that day. And that day, 700 people in that church were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. 
He told the congregation, and they began to sing the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved his wretch like me. Because when the wind and the fire start talking Jesus, you can't control what's going to happen next. I'd like to ask everybody to stand with me right now. We're going to have a time of prayer coming forward. If you feel that you're in a position, your life has placed a burden on you, if you need the prayers of the church, we'd invite you to come forward when we're singing this song that we're going to sing. But more than that today, I would make a plea that there's some in this audience, there's some listening to my voice today, that need to take that very step. Believe in Jesus and be baptized. You may say, Lee, well, I didn't come prepared to get baptized today. Well, neither did those 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost. They had no intention that day of getting baptized. But if you believe in Jesus, you need to go public. You need to be baptized. And it's the Holy Spirit that's tugging on your heart right now and calling you to do this thing. What are you waiting for? It's time for you to get down. Let's sing. Let's worship. Let's praise. Soon and very soon we are.